Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. So with me today, all the way from way across the pond, is Johnny Ball. He is with the Forget Me Not charity. It is designed to end the silent suffering of dementia caregivers, mostly in the UK, but I'm sure we can expand that a little bit someday. So thanks for joining me, Johnny. Thanks very much. Great to be here. So your mom took care of your dad for many years. Tell me about your dad and your caregiving journey. Yeah, so um, my dad got frontotemporal temporal dementia when I was probably about 13 or 14, looking mm. back. I mean, we didn't know initially. Um, it's kind of a very subtle onset. So there was some, some subtle signs, some sort of um, OCD-like behavior and um, you know habits that he definitely didn't used to have that sort of started coming in. And we, we weren't really sure what this meant. Um, but it's probably when I was about 17 that he was formally diagnosed. Um, but it was definitely a few years before that that he was starting to show the symptoms. Um, so that was now about 20 years ago. Um, so he had, yeah, it's a long time. Um, and then he had frontal temporal dementia until two years ago when he passed away. Um, and for the majority of that time, he lived at home with my mum. Um, so it was just those guys at home because my sister and myself, we'd gone to university and my other sister and brother had uh, left home quite a while back. Uh, so my mum single-handedly uh, cared for him for probably, I mean, all in probably 15 years. Um, and then time. towards, yeah, it's a long, long time. And I mean, as you know, it sort of gets a lot tougher, <laughs> a lot, lot tougher as things go on. So um, towards the very end, uh, he was put into a specialist care home um, who were amazing and looked after him. But even then, I mean, the, the journey doesn't end for the primary carer. As you know, mum would go and see him every single day. She still, um, you know, she wouldn't go on holiday. She just went and saw dad and looked after dad. So even though she wasn't looking after him all of the time, she was looking after him most of the time <laughs> and yeah. from afar. And I mean, the, the worry also never stops, right? In terms of uh, you always are concerned about their well-being of the, and worrying if they're comfortable and worrying if they're happy and worrying their state of mind. So that's all still there. Um, yeah, so that was, that was uh, kind of what happened. So it was really um, on the back of that, on seeing my mum's you know, uh, dedication and how tough it was, even though she handled it incredibly. And, you know, it was uh, so stoic <laughs> through the whole thing. Um, yeah, it was that that sort of uh, inspired this inspired this uh, expedition and the charity that we're going to start. So how is she doing now? She's doing well. Yeah, okay. she's doing very well. She's, uh, she's got a new life now, I'd say. Um, I'm sure. So I think, yeah, <laughs> I mean, exactly. Uh, no, so that it was uh, two, two and a half years ago that dad uh, died. And since then, I guess she's adjusted um, completely to the new life. But uh, it's, I suppose it's always still there, right? Uh, even though, yeah, she's definitely a lot, uh, it's definitely a very different way of living and uh, in some sense a relief, I suppose, but uh, it's still the transition's like tough work. Right? It's interesting because you still kind of have guilt. Like I know, especially now with the holidays coming, there's just times when, I think, you know, I tried so hard with my mom and like Christmas 2019, our city park is full of Christmas trees that are decorated with different organizations or businesses. Some of them just decorate them however they want. Some decorate them with a theme. Like one of them was basically a pizza Christmas tree. So all the decorations look like slices of pepperoni, slices of pizza, which is kind of not super Christmassy, but it was very cute. And I took her there because it was bright. It was outside. It, you know, I thought, oh, she'll love this. And it was just like, she was like clueless. And it was, and she was ornery. I think she was having a bad day. And 
it's hard knowing that was her last Christmas. We did have a really good lunch on the 23rd of December, and then everything went to hell after that. So there's, interestingly enough, you still have like these guilt feelings, like I should have done more, I could have done more. And it takes a while to get through those, I think. So it's, I'm, I'm finding that with myself and other caregivers that are in my position. So if you guys are experiencing that, it's pretty normal, which is frustrating, but there it is. So I read on your website that the Alzheimer's Society, which is pretty much the mere image of the Alzheimer's Association here in the States, found that 90% of caregivers experienced feelings of stress and anxiety weekly. <laughs> More like daily, probably. <laughs> yeah, exactly. and at least 60% of them struggle to talk about the impact of caregiving on their lives because of feelings of guilt. It's like, I can't complain about what I'm going through because my loved one has FTD or Alzheimer's or whatever. And so how can caregivers balance their needs and the needs of their loved ones, in your opinion? Like, you know, have we, have you thought that one through as you launched yeah, think, charity? Yeah, I think the, as with a lot of mental health things, I, I think the first thing to realize is that it's okay to feel the way you feel. Um, and I think caregivers have a lot of, as you just explained, a lot of guilt um, and a, an extreme sense of duty, um, which means that they put the, the person they're caring for first, often before themselves. But I think it's important for the mental health of the, you know, the caregiver, which then immediately impacts the well-being of the patient, that they need to care for themselves as well and remember that they have a duty of care to themselves as as much as they have a duty of care to the person that they're looking after. And I think in accepting that and um, really letting that sit inside you and know that that's true and giving yourself, giving yourself a break and giving yourself the option to feel how you feel and to um, accept that you need to care about yourself as well is the first step. Um, but also, I mean, a large part of what we'll be trying to do is uh, using technology to support give caregivers. And a big part of that is going to be uh, mental health technology. So, uh, for example, there's a lot of mental health apps that have been produced recently. Yeah. Uh, we're going to help with a distribution of that because a lot of caregivers are so busy. They just have their hands so full with their, what is essentially a, more than a full-time job. That they don't have time to go and find out about things like that. Like you and I know about, um, you know, men mental health apps or meditation apps, but a lot of people that are caregivers won't have time to discover these things. So it's important that we are proactive in um, explaining what's out there to help, whether they are specialist tools for caregivers or otherwise, and helping distribute them um, so that people can look after themselves as well as look after the person that they're caring for. Yeah, like I've experienced a little bit today, you have the best laid plans for, you know, you got your to-do list for the day and then you get up and at breakfast time, something blows up your morning. <laughs> yeah, so exactly. that's pretty much how caregiving goes. You know, you think, okay, well, I'll take my mom to the doctor or we'll go to the park or whatever. And then, you know, they have a different idea or they're having a bad day. And mm -hmm. I do think that as my generation, and you, you must be a, a well, you must be one of the old millennials, right? I'm 34. I don't know if that makes me a millennial or that, something else. Yeah, but. it does. <laughs> you're, yeah, you're in the middle. So I'm a Gen X. I'll be, when this episode comes out, I'll be 54. I got a birthday in a week, I think. <laughs> yes, a week. And um, it's like irrelevant this, about this time. And one of the things that I've found with a podcast, which obviously is technology, is that a lot of caregivers, they're older and they're just clueless. And I've even run across people that are about my age. And I'm like, there was a gal in my, that showed up. She needed a support group like now, today. And so she showed up. This was back in the old days when you could meet in person. She showed up to my support group from 20 miles away from my old hometown. And I said, oh, I've got the perfect solution for you. Let me show you my podcast. And I'm trying to show her. And of course, I have an iPhone. She had an Android phone. So I was having troubles because I'm not familiar with that. And she goes, 
oh, I don't do those things anyway. And I'm like, it would really help you because I talk to like fantastic people. And she just blew me off like whatever. I, I don't have time to think about a podcast. I'm like, it's the easiest way to get advice and information. So I'm hoping as we, you know, move through my generation, your generation, that it won't be such a challenge to use technology to support our caregiving needs. And is your focus with the charity mostly on mental health apps? No, not specifically, but the focus is on technology. Technology so, in general. Um, okay. Yeah, like the, the underlying principle is that uh, we can distribute technology broadly and cheaply. Um, it also is what I do as my day job. So it's, it's my specialty in terms of, and I you know, have a network and I understand how it works. Um, but I feel that we can, for a relatively low cost, just distribute or build um, or put caregivers in touch with the right technology that's going to help them. So the impact probably won't be as great as, for example, going to a support group, but the impact can be broad. So um, podcasts, for instance, once you know about them, fantastic. And you get all of this information and all of this impact for free. The problem is a lot of people don't know about them, don't even know the concept as you're describing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, so I, I think once we push... Uh, you know, push the different types of support that are available and potentially, you know, build our own technology to support people, then that should have a, a far reaching effect, we hope. So how did you decide? Well, tell me about, okay, well, we've talked, we kind of roundabout it into the forget me not charity. Tell me, tell me about what you're doing to raise awareness and hopefully to raise money to get all this fantastic stuff happening. Well, uh, so the game plan is essentially to row from Portugal uh, in Europe, so continental Europe, to French Guiana, which is in South America. So we're going to row across the Atlantic Ocean, um, diagonally, essentially, so that all, almost all of it. Um, <laughs> it's about 3,800 miles, um, and there'll be three of us in the boat. Uh, we will be the first boat of three people to ever row this uh, particular passage. Um, and we hope to break the world record for being the fastest boat to ever do it, which would be uh, 50 days. So the purpose is to obviously raise the first amount of capital that will allow the charity to be formed and to do the first piece of good work. So, yes, that's the, that's the game plan. So why that? You couldn't have, like, uh, you know, done a 10K or a marathon or an Ironman or, you know, bake sale? <laughs> yeah, I mean, my baking skills aren't that great, so maybe, maybe not the bake sale. Um, but, uh, I guess I wanted to do something big. Um, in, I wanted to make sure that we raised enough money to get the charity off the floor in a substantial way that means it could sustain itself for at least a couple of years. So um, in some sense, it's a really difficult thing to do, but at least it's compressed. So yeah. we're going to we were organizing this for a year and then uh, we will hopefully, fingers crossed, uh, do the row in January 22. And then that's kind of it. And we've got funding to really get things rolling. So it would take a lot of bake sales to cover <laughs> the uh, funding that we intend to raise. So we needed to think of something big and this felt like it was big enough. <laughs> so. Well, I can understand why you would want to break the world record because rowing that far for more than 50 days sounds like a total nightmare. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be, uh, it's going to be interesting. I mean, cause we're going, uh, it's essentially completely unsupported. So we just, uh, we set off from Portugal in our little rowing boat that you can see there. And, uh, we live in it, sleep in it, eat in it, carry all our food, um, and hopefully make it to the other side. <laughs> and how long is this boat? Uh, I think it's 28 foot, I believe. That's just very small. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite small, yeah. It's just, I mean, if you look at the, uh, on the photos, it's just about enough room for two people to sit rowing and a third person to kind of perch on the end. And there's just about enough room for two people in those cabins that you can see on uh, either side. And then you have to keep all of your equipment and food in the cabins and in the hold as well. And that picture will be on the social media so you guys can all see it or you can watch the YouTube video as well. Um <laughs> I'm looking at this boat and I've seen this picture for quite a while. It's incredible. So one of the things you told me when we first chatted was you have to time this to avoid hurricanes. Mm, that's right. <laughs> uh, 
So we're leaving in January. Um, there's two reasons actually. So there's two things we're trying to time. It's a bit of a it's a bit of an intricate operation. So we're we're timing the trade winds because we want to get on the winds so that we get blown in the right direction uh, across the Atlantic towards South America. But if we get it wrong, then when we hit South America, we hit the Caribbean hurricane season. So there's a pretty fine window of making sure that we get the winds, but not too much wind. So uh, hopefully we depart from Portugal early January and take the winds out to South America um, and then get there and row fast enough to avoid the hurricane season, which starts in about March. Um, so it's always the plan. <laughs> but then there are, of course, we'll be going straight through the doldrums as well. So although the doldrums is famous for being flat and calm with no wind at all, it's also, uh, it has freak storms. So um, we we'll go straight through the doldrums where there's a fair chance that we might get caught off guard with uh, the odd hurricane or something like that. And so if that happens, you said this is an unsupported sail. Mm. What do you do? Yeah. Just pull into the next port and wait for it to pass? or? Yeah, well, there's no ports. Um, oh, Lord. Door, I'm really getting <laughs> nervous for you. <laughs> yeah. So actually what you do is, um, so this, this boat is completely waterproof in, once you're in the cabin. So you actually climb in the cabin, seal, the, seal them shut, then you tie yourself to the floor and you sit and wait until uh essentially you get thrown around like a wine bottle uh until the storm passes because it can capsize without filling the water so you just get thrown around and then uh when it's done you hope that you have enough equipment to come out the other side yeah. uh you're not selling this uh cruise too well <laughs> 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 I, hope, I mean, obviously, we hope that won't happen. It does happen to people, but yeah. <laughs> well, we're going to keep our fingers crossed. And we've had tons of, you know, tropical storms and hurricanes this year, the most ever. So, fingers crossed that we're just kind of kicking off. We're just we're using up all the storms for the next <laughs> yeah, couple they blow years. Blow themselves out. That's, that's it. <laughs> They're all done. That's done. <laughs> so, tell me about this. The other two guys that are going to. do <laughs> Go on this crazy cruise with you. <laughs> I'm going to start calling it a cruise. I like that. It's a, <laughs> a cruise to me reminds me of the Titanic or something, you know. With the, <laughs> well, I don't know. The, <laughs> the Titanic at least had lifeboats. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, we'll have a little, a little lifeboat. Um, so the other two guys are really good friends of mine. Um, one is a South African uh, consultant surgeon. He works uh, in the Children's Hospital in Cape Town. Um, so he'll be he'll be joining, and the other is a childhood friend who actually spent uh, a lot of time looking after my dad when we were younger, especially when I went to university. And he's uh, he, he's got his own business in electrician and then uh, alarms in uh, back in South Wales. So he'll be he'll be joining us as well. And are have you guys always been sailors? Like no. you're really super experienced at this, right? So um, uh, the other thing is this: uh, Stefan, who's the guy in uh, the guy in Wales, the electrician, he is a sailor. Um, so he's been sailing since he was younger. So he's got experience. And then Dirk, the South African guy, also has uh, sailing qualifications and has done it. But I do not have any. So I'm the I'm the new guy on the boat, uh, <laughs> and I'll be leaning on those guys for the for the nautical experience. And so, obviously, you're not going to row for 24 hours straight. Mm. I hope. <laughs> well, we, well, we are. Yeah, we're going to row two hours on, two hours off, or nonstop. So, is it two guys rowing at a time, or one yeah, at a time? Most, yeah, most of the time. So, it'll be, it, it's a bit awkward with three people. Uh, most people don't row with three people because the shift patterns are just not very good. Um, but usually it will be two people rowing for two hours in a block or and then you essentially swap them out so it's uh, you each do two hours on two hours off um except maybe in the night time where we'll have one person rowing for four hours and then you the other two guys get two, four hours sleep because otherwise you only ever sleep for two hours which is obviously no good yeah so, even four um, is really rough yeah, yeah i mean you can you can manage but oh boy that's <laughs> <laughs> Oh my goodness! What a, you know? <laughs> you sure you don't? I can. I'm really good at baking. I could probably help you out with that. One. <laughs> yeah, maybe you could teach me to bake and stitch it, and then I could uh, cook some cakes and do a bake sale. Yeah, we only need like you know what half a billion cupcakes or something. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I like to bake, but holy Toledo, that might push me over the limit. So <laughs> once you get this charity up and running, tell me. What's the goal after that? Okay, 
provided you guys survive this trip. <laughs> yeah, assuming, assuming we come back. I mean, obviously the big goal is get things rolling, first of all. Um, but then we're going to find a selection of the technological products and we need to decide whether we're going to build things or not. So there'll be a lot of, I think, before we... Uh, actually go out and start up trying to distribute things and have immediate impact, there'll be a lot of research to do. So um, I'm researching this year as well, obviously. Um, but then once we raise the funds and we come back from the row, it'll be trying to find the right products. So um, whether that's, uh, you know, whether that is on the mental health side of things or whether that's actually more uh, sort of physical technology. So uh, some of the technology that's used to support dementia patients in the home, there's a lot of good stuff happening in the UK in this. But again, like no one knows about it. So yeah. um, we need to do a lot of research, basically, and find out where best is it to put our efforts and where can we have um, what we're really seeking to do, seeking to have the most impact for the most people at the lowest cost, essentially. So we want to be distributing things. Um, and it's cheaper to distribute software than it is to distribute physical hardware, but there's a balance between the, you know, the positive effect it's going to have on people and the, the cost of distribution. So we need to choose where to start. <laughs> so what kind of things are you looking at right now, knowing that we're the very beginning of this whole process? Kind of what, what things are looking interesting? In in sense of the product side of things? Yeah, with the technology or the products. Yeah. I mean, so, so I, 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 the main categories that I'm considering are... So the social network side of things, and I mean, I know that sort of sparks images of Facebook and what have you, but I'm really talking about online communities that specialize in uh, caregivers, and there's quite a few of them here in the UK. Um, whether we decide to start our own community that will probably be very local focused. So in the way that you talk about your support group, I think that, you know, we're a lot smaller in the UK, but um, we could still have uh, local support groups that are online where people can build up friends in their local area that are facing similar problems. Um, and I think that kind of network is just super important. And you can't always leave the person you're caring for at home while you go out in person to these groups. But to have that in your phone, on your computer, at the touch of a button is super valuable. Um, the next one, which we already mentioned, is the mental health side of things. Um, so there are already loads of good apps out there. Um, for mental health support. And I think that uh, amongst ones that are for general use or for um, this case in particular, that we'll be able to find lots of good things and hopefully um, either get some sort of partnership with one of the, the larger mental health support apps or the meditation apps. Um, or again, we can most likely partner in some way with a specialist and build our own tech there. Um, and the final piece, I've already started some conversations with uh, people that specialize in physical products. So the likes of um, a company I spoke to this week uh, essentially have electrics, kind of electric pressure mattresses. Um, mm -hmm. And they're, they're for sending alerts as to when a patient might have fallen out of bed. Or if you're sleeping in a separate room, you can get notifications if they're not uh, it's, it's much smarter than just a pressure pad. It's got a lot of sensors in it. It can tell you the, the types of movements that would usually happen in the night if they're not happening and this type of thing. And then um, further systems they're building it to do with uh, essentially invisible detectors around the home. So they're, they're LIDAR detectors that are picking up uh, movements around the house. So if you know someone's wandering or if they're not wandering um, so that you know uh, whether the normal behavior is happening or not and you have some kind of... Um, some kind of alert to your phone or some information as to what's happening, which, uh, yeah, which I think is really, you know, would have been really valuable for dad who essentially always crept out of bed and wandered out the house. And, you, you know, you'd think you'd hear someone, right? But you, you don't. <laughs> um, so to have sort of alerts and alarms on the door without feeling like you're installing security everywhere, these things are very subtle and very discreet. I think that's really important. That actually sounds really good. I know some people that I've talked to have said, you know, they have family members that get up in the middle of the night and walk out the front door. Mm -hmm. And a lot of play, you know, a lot of caregivers say, well, you need a lock that you have to unlock to get out. And then other well-meaning people will say, well, no, you can't have that. Cause if there's a fire, you don't want to have to fumble with a key or a lock. And it's like, you know, they get all this, you know, both things are good advice but they counteract each other. So 
something a little less Fort Knox. I don't know, uh, Tower of London prison, I think <laughs> it's like over there, um, would be nice. I saw a rug and I really wish I'd saved it. It was, I think I was scrolling through Instagram or Twitter or something and you plop it on the floor. It li li literally looks like a vortex hole. And I'm like, something like that in front of the door would seriously prevent somebody with Alzheimer's or probably FTD from leaving because it really looked like you were going to step into just like another dimension. It was really, really interesting. Really very, interesting. very interesting. That to me is a really simple and, you know, because um, I know from talking to other caregivers, one that works at the care home that my mom was at, they got their dad this really comfortable um, black leather chair. And as his disease progressed, he stopped sitting in it because they kind of see the black as like a big hole. And my mom had in interesting, similar um, challenges with light and dark and shadows. It was very hard for her to tell what was what when, there, when it wasn't like a flat visual surface. So, you know, I could... Yeah, it is, you know, and because everybody's different, you know, the different diseases affect people somewhat differently. It does make it a challenge. So if you ever need a uh, focus group person, I'm sure I could pull together some people that have had I, some experiences. Yeah, I mean, that's, uh, yeah really, that would be fantastic because that, that genuinely is the first step. I mean, th as you know, it's such a diverse disease that like, everyone's experience is different. And to select the right things, we, you know, there's only even if we do the row and it all goes successfully and we raise the amount of money we want to, there's still limited powder in the keg, right? And we want we want to make sure that we use the money in the right way. And you know, focus groups and research is definitely going to be the like the first step and the key to finding out. How to. Well, I like what you're mentioning with like the online community, and I think if you did an online community that was somewhat a combination of a Zoom call like what we're doing and Facebook groups. So you can either link up with somebody on an app. You can tell I don't use too many of those like WhatsApp and those other things. I'm just old enough. And my daughter, who's 29, does not. She uses like YouTube and uh, Discord, I think. But she uh, messages me the normal way. So. <laughs> <laughs> the normal way. Not See, you know, I message the normal text message way. And occasionally she calls, which is usually something big because she doesn't like to talk on the phone. But what I don't like about the Facebook groups is you'll ask a question and you'll get like 50, 60, 200, 300 responses. Nobody has time to read through all that nonsense. And a lot of it, when I read through it, isn't helpful in my opinion because it's kind of like, well, one person says A, one person says B, and both are good advice, but what do you do? And face-to-face -face is really good. And I know my support group, many of the members would, are anxiously awaiting to when we can actually meet again in person. But a lot of them also want the option to have the meeting streamed, you know, via Zoom, which is how we do it currently. So that if they can't get out of the house or, you know, they're just tired and they don't feel like driving over downtown whatever you know whatever excuse you just want to like lay around in your pajamas and talk to people you know so i'm hoping that the alzheimer's association figures out how to do a hybrid version so you can meet in person and have streaming i mean that's not their focus but you know the pandemic has forced organizations and companies and you know just we've had a big shift in how we do things and some of it is good and you know, I mean, the pandemic is awful, but some of it is, I think, I think we've learned a lot of things that hopefully are going to help our, our societies moving forward. I mean, yeah, I really think, I mean, obviously there were very, very few good things that came out of the yeah. pandemic, but um, in terms of adoption of technology and uh, like video technology, video conferences like this are incredibly valuable and Obviously, I'm slightly biased in that this is, you know, my strong belief, but um, it's really opened the door to a lot of things for a lot of people. And someone like my mum, who never, ever would have 
got on a FaceTime call or known what Zoom was, now has Zoom and FaceTime on her phone, and she does that instead of calling me. And <laughs> that is, you know, that's really cool because it's better. <laughs> it's essentially, it is better. You can connect, you can connect with people in, in a more uh, natural way, as much, although it is not as good as meeting in person. It's, it's better than a phone call. And uh, I think that in the context of caregivers is really powerful. You get a more personal connection with those that you're talking to and you can do it, as you said, in your home, in your pyjamas, if you're out of energy or if that meeting has to happen at 9 p.m. or if you can't leave the house. Um, so I think, yeah, I think that is one of the very, very few uh, positive things that have come out of the 2020. Yeah, I've used Zoom for a little over two years and many of my guests are significantly older. Well, I had one gal who was 80 and she referred to herself as a tech klutz, which I love because, you know, they didn't grow up with computer. I mean, I was in high school when we got our first computers. You grew up with computers. So, you know, it's just adapting the technology when you haven't used it before. She was, I could, let's see. She, I can't remember. She was on a landline phone and the Zoom call. And I'm trying to talk her through why she couldn't hear me. Because I think I could hear her. I forgot exactly which way it was. <laughs> so it's like, I have a lot less of those problems now. <laughs> you know, even the 80 plus year olds are just, they're just Zoom wizards. That's what they do all the time. So it's, it has definitely been a benefit. So let's see. I'm going to look at my questions really quick before I let you go. It'd help if I put my glasses on too, make it easier to read it quicker. <laughs> so I put up the picture with the GoFundMe link. So why don't you, while I look at my notes, I'll let you tell everybody about the GoFundMe really quick. Yeah, sure. So um, the GoFundMe link on the screen is essentially probably the easiest way if you would like to support the expedition and the charity uh, to do so. Um, it's brand new. I just set it up uh, in time for the podcast. So, uh, so far, this is uh, ground zero. We're starting uh, as of today. So uh, if anyone would be uh, kind enough to want to donate, then uh, please go to the GoFundMe link here and it should be a uh, simple process and uh, there's a little bit more of an explanation um, about what we talked about and the link to the website where there's full information uh, and obviously if there's anything else you'd like to know um, please do just drop us an email as well um, contact details on the website so I have one quick question once you get to the French it's French Guyana correct yes that's right are you rowing home too <laughs> <laughs> that would be bold. Uh, no, that's oh, good. <laughs> <we're gonna row. laughs> yeah. uh, I think we'll be done with rowing for a long, long time. I'm sure. Time <laughs> so how do you get home? Uh, we will fly. <laughs> and, the, and what? You're going to leave the boat in French Guyana? No, we're going to ship it home in a shipping container, actually. No oh, fun. That's not cheap yeah. either. Uh, no, I mean, it's, it's not as bad as you think. Uh, because it's quite a common shipping route. So uh, we, have a, ah. we have a guy that in the Netherlands who's arranging that for us. That's interesting. My only experience with, and it's not direct, my dad used to, well, twice he traveled to Zimba, Zambia, Africa for um, the International Vision Volunteers. And they had to, you know, they would go down there and do cataract surgeries. So they needed surgical chairs and you know they needed all kinds of heavy equipment <laughs> and so they had to fill up shipping containers so while he was down there the first year they decided they were going to create a library for the villagers and the the ones close by and the ones sort of close by and my paternal grandmother who is 102 and a half is very proud of her efforts to collect books to fill up that shipping container to ship them to Africa from Northern California, which is probably not a typical shipping route. Because <laughs> they basically, it was like, it's going to cost you X number of dollars to ship this container to Africa. You might as well fill it up. So that's my experience with shipping things across the continents. 
We're going to have a lot of books. <laughs> yeah. She's, um, I recorded it because, you know, my dad is gone and I've recorded her telling the story for posterity. And it's really interesting what she went through to collect books. She was a head librarian at one of our schools here in town. So there's a big family connection. So it's, so one of these days I'll get the video of, africa and her and books and get it all put together with her story it's about 10 minutes and that'll be on my youtube channel but oh, that sounds amazing i have to have websites that don't blow up and other things going on <laughs> i just need some extra time you know like probably you're thinking about so do you have a training regimen for this journey that you're going to be doing <laughs> yeah we do um so that we're pretty much starting now on that um so we're gonna have to do a lot of lifting of weights and a lot of rowing on rowing machines. <laughs> um, as whenever we can, we'll get the boat out on the actual water as a team. It's a bit tricky as we're um, all in different locations, but uh, it's important to get some hours in actually on the water to get the, the technique nailed as well. Um, but yeah, lots of hours sitting on a rowing machine um, and just putting in the work, <laughs> eating a lot as well. Uh, oh, eating a lot. Dang, that's not in my training plan. <laughs> <laughs> I can recommend um, brain bars. They're, they're protein bars that are specifically designed to keep you mentally alert, which sounds like you're going to need. Yeah. I'm sure my friend from San Diego would happily ship them to, you're in Wales, right? I'm in London, actually. But, oh, you're in uh, London. Okay. Yeah. I don't know why I thought you were in Wales. I get all confused. Like I said, it's been a day. <laughs> I'm Welsh. Ah. <laughs> it's just because Steph's in Wales. Yeah. That, that's probably, I probably saw it on the website. So do you have a last pitch or a last little something you want to tell sure, the listeners? I mean, along, along the lines of the brain bars, I mean, we, uh, obviously, if you would like to donate, there's the GoFundMe links there, but also we're looking for all kinds of support. So we are going to need, for example, to eat a lot of food on this boat. So if uh, anyone out there uh, could offer any kind of support, whether it's uh, equipment, um, support with contacts in the marine industry, any kind of um, expedition food supplies. Uh, we also need what we call land crew support. So social media and PR and all of this type of stuff. At the moment, I'm doing the whole lot with the rest of the crew and uh, there aren't enough hours in the day <laughs> so if you would like to offer any kind of support we would gratefully accept it and uh that would be really amazing well i'm a good photographer i'm a photographer that was my previous career until this year and i'm really good at social media so i can help you out with that oh, and prefer you know hopefully since all of my travels got blown to smithereens this year and our trip to where are we going taipei in june next year right now i'm kind of giving it a 60 40 60 percent chance we're going to actually make it it's our rotary international convention we were supposed to have two weeks in hawaii in june this year oh. yeah oh. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah that it was i kept saying you know first my my business trip to colorado who um got canceled that was the 18th to the 21st of march so as we all know that was ground zero for this whole craziness starting the end of april my husband and i were supposed to do a rotary trip to the far tip of california so as far north as you can get and still be in california and then it was hawaii and so the first trip got canceled and then the second trip and i was just like yes <laughs> hawaii is not going to happen I, I mean why would you have 30,000 people from across the globe descend on a little island in the very beginning of a pandemic. Yeah, no. Mm -mm. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't know. Taipei, although Pfizer did say they got a vaccine they think is going to hey. work. Yeah, exactly. That was good news today, right? So maybe I should give bump that up to 70-30. We'll be positive. It's looking good. Yeah. So, good. you know, if I, if I, uh, I don't know. I'm on the wrong side of the uh, United States to uh, be close to you guys, but I'm sure we can work something out. I, I need uh, the travel bug is really uh, unfulfilled right now. <laughs> well, French Guiana is a great place. I'm telling you. <laughs> I'm sure. Is it is it good in January or is that the off season with the hurricanes? Uh, we'll be hitting it in about late February. So uh, I don't know. I think. We'll, we'll miss hurricane season. I'm confident we'll miss it, <laughs> which means it'll be nice. It'll be nice okay. And, and well, they also do a lot of space launches at a French Guiana. 
Did you know that? It's uh, tons, tons of the space launches that happen, happen in French Guiana. I did not know they did any space launches other than Florida and Texas. Well, Florida, no. they launch, Texas, they land. Occasionally, they land in California. Yeah, French Guiana is the, I think it's the third of the, of the states, like the two main bases in the states and then French Guiana. Interesting. Well, February is not a great month in California. It's wet and cold and foggy and wet, <laughs> which I know that's your typical weather. <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say, sounds like a British summer, right? Yes. I was in <laughs> Scotland in 1981. They had a freaking heat wave. It was all of, for me, 72 degrees. So that's about the high teens, low 20s for you guys. You guys were all dying and I was cold. And then I came home and it was 40 degrees hotter. It was 110, which is normal for here. That's like 35 for you. So my body went... What the hell did you just do? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that was quite wild, but I'm, I'm definitely ready to go back. My ancestry is Scottish, so it's time to hit wow. time to hit back over there. So you never know. 2022 sounds like it's a long ways off, but it's not. Well, definitely give us a shout if you uh, if you land in the UK. We'll be here. Well, I definitely will do that. I appreciate this chat today. And I'm great. I will I will help you with your social media to get this uh, funding going. Fantastic. Really appreciate it. Really great to chat, Jen. And you thank too. You thank much. you. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts.